Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our, our evening uh, webinar tonight. I'm Martin Golston. I'm the South Wales and West of England and, uh, uh, sort of co-chair. Um, tonight, so uh, we are very, really pleased to welcome Bob Willis. And so Bob's an enterprise agile coach in IBM's EMEA uh, Agile Centre of Competence. So he's uh, got quite a few years of experience around uh, agile in all its many, many, many forms. And so he's going to share his experience with us tonight. But evaluation sheets, please let us know what you think of tonight's event is really important for us as a branch, as a committee of volunteers. We get your feedback so we understand what you want to see uh, in, in the future and sort of the types of event that is important to you for your personal professional development. So please give us that feedback and let us know what, how tonight's gone for you and the value that you've got out of it as well, please. That's really important. Um, any questions, usual thing on, on, the, on the platform tonight, please uh, put them on the, on, on the, in, in the question area on the platform. And then Rob Allen will sort of put them to uh, to Bob at the end of the uh, presentation, the Q and A session. So please, please do that as you as you go along, please. Uh, a bit about uh, APM, uh, usual stuff. Um, tonight we are uh, sort of as a branch, we're starting to plan physical events for early next year. And we've got one definitely sort of uh, lined up for for March. So, uh, but we'll be doing a mix of um, uh, sort of hybrid events, some physical, some virtual events. There, there's pros and cons of both. The pros and cons. Of the, of the virtual events is we can meet, reach far more people and there's no traveling involved. But we do want to get proper networking together and actually encourage that to encourage that networking as well as getting back to buffets and all the usual bits and pieces that you're so used to and you've missed for the last uh, couple of years. So we're looking forward to that very much in the new year. And as a reminder of all the excellent resources on the APM website from, uh, from the e-learning modules, from the uh, sort of uh, competency framework, all the guides, all the stuff you can download as members. So please uh, get involved with that. And also take a look at the uh, APM Hub, which is your uh, sort of opportunity to sort of share and uh, sort of network with your fellow members. Um, so please get, please have a go with that as well and, and look out for the sort of developments on that. The SIGs have a new, new areas on that. We hope the branches will have specific areas on that before too long as well. If you're interested in, ch in the Chartered Project Professional, there's a lot of guidance out on the website and uh, APM generally have a lot of, um, sort of webinars that they run pretty regularly on how to apply for CHPP. So do get involved in that if you're interested. Branch events coming up. We've got uh, one next week, uh, which is a virtual networking event. So it's not the book with a buffet, but it's a virtual event. And that's a looking at empowering a lot young professionals. So please do get involved to share your experience if you're older and want to share that with uh, sort of young professionals. If you're younger, want to find out more, sort of get involved in that and uh, see if you can sort of uh, work out to, to, from some of the, the old and the bold what you need to do. The 15th of February, we are going to be looking at the Tamar Bridge in Cornwall and the revamp pro, uh, program that's been going on that. That will be a webinar. Um, the 16th of March, we have Natural Resources Wales and they're just looking at how they set up their PMO office. And that's going to be our first physical event and we hope to hold that in Bristol. The final venue of that is being uh, sort of a, a finalised at the moment. So do look out for those. And we're also looking forward to early next year. We haven't exactly fixed the venue yet is to start our newcomers events again, which are really, really uh, popular and actually essential to be sort of actually networking together and physical, physical events. We really cannot do those, those virtually. So we, we plan to do those as well. As I said, we plan to do continue with virtual as well as uh, physical events into next year. So now without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Bob Willis. Um, Bob is going to discuss tonight what really matters for agile project delivery and why organisations often get this wrong. I think his title is a bit more catchy than that, but uh, that's the essence of it, I think. So, Bob, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome, guys. Um, thanks for giving your evening up to this. It's my pleasure to be with you. Um, I figured I was discussing what to cover with the guys at APM in this session tonight, and I guess my thoughts were that, you know, we've been working in a in a virtual way for some time now in a distributed way because of COVID. But some of us, um, myself included from next month, will be going back uh, into the office. And that kind of balance and potential uh, hybrid nature of working, I thought it was time to discuss how we, we almost strengthen our commitment to, uh, in the sphere of agile, 
great agile delivery. Um, so not getting into the nitty gritty of the detail of different frameworks, different methodologies, um, but looking at it from a foundational perspective as to what's, what's truly needed. What do you guys in your organizations um, need to do? So a little bit about me. Um, I'm an enterprise agile coach within Within our center of competency for Agile uh, at IBM, covers um, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, I've been involved with Agile in all its flavors for the last 16 years or so, uh, since working with General Motors in the US. Um, this slide is not meant to be the typical boasting slide, although it does kind of have more badges than a Boy Scout on it. But um, the reason for me showing you that is that as a coach, I have to be almost an agnostic as to all the frameworks and methodologies out there. And, and for you guys as well, I think it's important to understand that not every flavor fits every context. So context um, is really important here when you're looking at some of the things that we're gonna talk about. So let's get into this. Um, I was thinking about how to start this off. And um, in the UK, at least, I don't know where all of you guys are from. I'm sure we'll see that later on. It's getting a bit chilly, getting a bit chilly now. And I thought, right, we need to get the uh, the boiler running. Um, and so I, you know, turned the thermostat on. Nothing happened. So I hit, this is a picture of my boiler reset button here. I hit this big reset button and everything magically started work again. It's all lovely and toasty in here. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could just kind of hit our, almost our ways of working reset button, take all the things we've learned since COVID hit from working in distributed fashion. Um, because, you know, we worked with distributed teams before COVID. It's just that they got Kind of less of a focus a lot more tools out there now a lot more awareness a lot more acceptance of working remotely and physically and a hybrid between the two um so this is not a question of let's go back to the way it was but a, a kind of a question of how do we mix the two saying that let's take a picture back into stuff that you guys may remember from and the way you were working in a physical environment. This is a shot I took um, at IBM's offices in South Bank, uh, in London in the UK. Um, and we're kind of seeing here, let me just turn the um, pointer on real quick. See the laser pointer there. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff on the fourth floor in South Bank, um, working with the uh, oil and gas company, We've got a whole bunch of storyboarding, boarding, app development. We've got uh, product backlogs. We've got sprint backlogs. We've got burn down charts, release burn apps, build monitors, the whole shebang. And this is just one corner of this room. Um, so, I mean, I love that kind of stuff. And it's it just it, the, the amount of excitement in that room, the amount of energy in that room was, was, was awesome. Um, so I thought, right, let's let's move on from this. Um, I remember seeing a tweet recently from Alistair Coburn, who's one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto, where someone brought up something he'd said a long time ago about that working in uh, a, a virtual manner, working remotely, it would never work. Um, and I think, you know, he said, yeah, I should probably eat my words. Um, but at the end of the day, face-to-face -face working is always going to have the edge. If you can do it, it's, you know, that is definitely um, the way, way to go. In fact, the way he put it was, um, you, you, could, you could run a marathon wearing hiking boots. It wouldn't be great, but you could do it. Yes, you, know, so you always want to have a pair of Nikes when you can. So let's just take a look at what success looks like. I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of discussion about, about waterfall, but as far as this 
kind of set of charts from um, the Standards Group, who publish the Chaos Report every two years. This is the one from 2018. Uh, I don't know if they did one in 2020 because of COVID. I'll have to dig into that. But obviously, the stuff on the left is showing you waterfall delivery, um, you know, more than 75% of waterfall projects having some kind of issues. That's not the important thing to talk about here. The important thing is on the right, that, you know, with all of the agile frameworks out there and the focus on, on business agility through all layers of an organization and working with teams, there are still problems with agile delivery. Yeah, less than 50% of them are fully successful. So we've got some work to do. Um, and, you know, this, I mean, this was a, a pre-COVID set of statistics, which is probably going to give us a representative view of what things were like in that environment. So we want to hit this reset button. We want to understand the kind of things that are needed to make agile delivery successful. We're going to start with a, especially as it's nearly Christmas, um, a lovely wrapped present of product vision. Yeah. So we want to have some mechanism um, for looking at our organizational strategic objectives and how they link to the work that our, our teams are actually doing. I'm, I'm not sure how many guys out there, um, how many of you actually have a product vision? Um, that would be the first question to ask yourselves. And why not? If you do have one, um, is it is it readily um, accessible? Yeah. When this was a physical environment, of you know, obviously we'd have it up on the walls. Um, if we we're using Scrum teams or Kanban teams, um, every ceremony, every event, we would have. This is kind of like a a north star, a guiding light for the development that we're doing. A little more difficult working virtually, but you can put this stuff big and visible on your dashboards, whichever electronic um, tools you're using, because it's really important. We need to know why we're doing the work that we're doing. How does it link to success for an organization? So, linked to that, we probably have maybe a set of goals that we're trying to achieve um, in the face of uh, this vision that we've we've uncovered. Um, kind of linked with the, the football theme here, but um, I was coaching Liverpool Football Club. Do not laugh. Um, I am rubbish at football. This was in an agile coaching um, kind of environment where they were developing a, an app for their fan base. And we were developing a product vision for them to take back into their own environment um, and not have it set in stone. Yeah, these things, um, these kind of artifacts should be constantly retrospected on as uh, to, to being fit for purpose for the environment in which they use. Um, we developed this this uh, vision for them, and we looked at mechanisms for achieving goals that would, along the way, contribute to the vision. There's a lot of work being done um, in the uh, kind of OKR, Objective Key Results, kind of space. A lot of organizations that I coach uh, are using that as a mechanism for tracking tracking progress towards um, the direction that an organization wishes to go in. That is one way of doing that, perfectly fine. Um, another way that I really like though, I'm gonna talk about next. Um, however, in order to really understand this, we need to talk about underpants. So, <laughs> thanks to South Park um, and Goiko Adchek, who uh, is kind of behind the uh, impact mapping uh, movement. I'll give you a reference um, to his website shortly. Um, he uses this analogy of kids finding out that in the morning all of their underwear is missing. What is going on? So they set a trap and in the middle of the night they catch this underpants gnome stealing their underpants. 
And they're like, what's going on? Why are you doing this? Oh, we have to. We have to collect as many underpants as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, you know, they take the, the kid back to their underground lair where they have big mountains of underpants that they, they've managed to collect here. Very happy gnomes doing their work. And that's great. That's wonderful. Um, but then we ask why? Always start with why. Why are we collecting all the underpants? Well, that's easy. Um, phase one, we collect the underpants. And phase three, profit. Yes, but what about phase two? Oh, yeah, we don't, we don't talk about that. Profit, that's what's important. So they have goals, they have um, deliverables almost, but they're missing a kind of key ingredient um, in the middle of all of this. If we look at this kind of almost this taxonomy, um, this decomposition of an organization's strategic goals, yeah, from whichever uh, agile or project management, if you like, looking at Prince2, APM, um, PMP, whichever one, whichever flavor you like, there's usually something around strategic objectives, um, benefits, business change, project outputs, all that good stuff, all linked together. Well, this is no different, but we're trying to understand how we get from the top to the bottom and how we get from the bottom back up to the top. Yeah, so understanding what this taxonomy, what this um, decomposition, getting more granular until we actually deliver um, something that works. And one of these techniques that I love, that I've used with many clients is impact mapping. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but I think it's a clear way um, of collaboration between those who want something at a senior level within an organization. So we're looking at strategic goals and those who are delivering, you know, within teams, user stories, uh, getting those deployed in production. Great, that's wonderful stuff. But what links them together? And the main thing here uh, that Goiko Ajak is uh, proposing that is kind of transparent, if you like, is the impact on the actors of a particular system. So we have our overall goal here that this slide is showing uh, that we want to grow our mobile app advertising. So that's our, our end game, that's our strategic objective. Um, we have a bunch of actors that can help us with this. Yeah, we've got three there. And at the other end of the scale, um, you can see that we've got you know, some user stories in a backlog somewhere on the right hand side. Now, the bit in the middle is the impact. We are aiming um, to almost have some kind of change in behavior. So this change in behavior at the impact uh, area is looking at users of a system and looking at the behavior change that we would like them to have. Do we want people to do something more often? Do we want to prevent them or make something uh, less accessible for them? Do we want them to start doing something, stop doing something? Whatever it might be, we want to illustrate our impact at this level with something measurable yeah so stay longer stay how much longer 10 minutes longer whatever it happens to be we need some almost victory criteria to understand if we've met the impact now you may think well this is very similar perhaps to to okrs yeah we've got an objective on the left hand side we've got some um some key results that maybe you might try and equate to impact. Main difference with this is that we don't have to do everything. It's almost like um, a competition in a way. We can see that, right, we want this impact, first one here, come back more frequently. Um, and we've got some potential deliverables that we think will help kind of illustrate that impact, encourage that impact. So we've got push updates and we've got special offers. 
Why not put them competing against each other? Let's try push updates first. Let's have an experiment. All good agile frameworks are proponents of fast feedback loops, running experiments, having a hypothesis, seeing what happens, yeah? So we, we write some stories, we've got those stories in the backlog, we get the teams to deliver something quickly, and we see what happens. Have we had an effect on users' behavior? Now this is subtly different to the way we look at overall big ticket goals in an organization that you don't know necessarily if you've met those goals until two years down the line when the thing has been fully deployed and we're getting users on board and we're understanding the behavior change at that point. We need to know if we're going in the right direction now. So the smaller kind of deliverables that we've got over here, a few stories that um, are giving a certain capability, we can measure impact on users' behavior. That is the subtle difference. And if we reach that, um, let's take the stay longer one here. Um, if we reach that victory criteria of they've stayed 10 minutes longer on average with forums, don't bother doing chats. Now you've reached the victory criteria, you've reached the objective you want. It's contributing to the goal you want. Um, simplicity, one of the key principles of the Agile Manifesto that's perhaps 20 years old now, guys, but it's still really applicable. So I just thought it was worth you guys looking um, at maybe another opportunity for collaborative workshopping, virtually or physically, to understand what goals you're achieving, why you're achieving them, and delivering the right stuff and knowing you're going in the right direction. Um, so moving on, you've got maybe a whole bunch of stuff in your backlog and you want a lot. Yes, as a customer, um, I've seen this with, with many clients. Uh, there's one in particular I'm thinking of where we had another consulting company who engaged with a client to elicit all their requirements, put together a beautiful requirements document, and then uh, we were brought in to actually deliver the thing. And what they, they'd kind of done was um, they, they'd understood maybe some agile delivery mechanisms, and they'd taken a pair of scissors and they cut this requirements document up and kind of turned it into a set of almost pseudo user stories. Yeah, so you've got this whole backlog of stuff and they wanted all of it. Um, well, this is a little crazy. You've probably seen this yourselves and it's probably worth pointing out a subtle statistic again from the Standish Group. 65% from this Standish Group report in 2018, they did a study of waterfall projects over five years um, and this number is the percent change of requirements over the course of their projects massive massive figure 65 percent of your um, requirements are in flux over the course of that project why on earth would you try and fix them at the beginning when you know this big white elephant is sitting in the room yeah so this is kind of key to understand how you're going to plan for the work that you're doing yeah so lipstick agile when we have a kind of waterfall up front and we're trying to put some some agile ways of working to support that is not ideal you truly need to understand what's the best way of delivering using whichever flavor of Agile you choose. And this goes to all the options that you've got in your backlog. You may think, right, well, no, we're not gonna do everything, but we want to reduce risk. We want to make sure that in five years time, um, our architecture is gonna support uh, potential, potential business and user needs that might crop up. Um, However, this future proofing from a technical perspective is going to clog 
your systems up with maybe a base architecture that is way too big and complex than what it actually needs to be to support your current business. Um, and from the perspective of the backlog itself, um, I was coaching a team about six years ago in Amsterdam. Um, and originally I was looking at the contents of their backlog. They had 475 user stories in their product backlog for one team. They were never going to touch the stuff down the bottom. So I work with the product owners and tell them I'm going to delete everything that's six months old or greater, which freaked them out a little bit. But they understood that if someone wants something, they can always ask for it again. So don't plan for every eventuality. What we do want to do, however, is to understand that these plans, and everybody has a plan, right? Um, as Mike Tyson said, uh, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face, right? Because things change. We need to understand how to manage that change effectively. And agile methods are great at doing this if they're done with the understanding of the response they'll get and feedback is king. Feedback is the one thing that we strive to get with all the Agile frameworks out there. Shorter feedback cycles, um, that's linked to other factors that we look at with Agile delivery. Small batch sizes, small batch sizes are going to move through your system um, with a more consistent flow, with less variability, with higher quality, um, and a enable you to get feedback preferably from real users, as soon as possible. Are we gonna go in the right direction with what we've just delivered? Are we going to persevere in this direction or are we going to pivot? And we're gonna try something else. So we know what we're doing. We've got a backlog appropriately sized. We have mechanisms in place, maybe including um, some good DevOps, mindset, practices, and tooling and automation that maybe helps us get this feedback. How do we prioritize what we do? Um, I have to excuse my pick of low drawings, but what we're trying to do here is represent, this is my drawing of a hippo. Um, I've often seen, um, thinking of an example of a UK government department in Cardiff that I worked with, um, in talking with their heads of department, they use this method of prioritization, hippo prioritization, highest paid person's opinion. You've probably heard of this, the squeaky wheel, he or she who shouts loudest. Um, and in this environment, you know, whoever's pet project um, gets the biggest kind of uh, noise around it, that's what's going to go first. Um, people change their minds constantly. And that has a negative impact on the teams who are actually um, doing delivery because they're constantly stopping and starting initiatives. They need focus. And focus is one of the five scrum key values and all the agile frameworks are encouraging, um, you know, having a clear focus tied to that product vision that we talked about earlier on. Um, so what do we do about that? Um, there's a lot of work done by a guy called Don Reinertsen. Uh, got his book right here, Principles of Product Development Flow. This is only available in hardback. It's not in Kindle, it's not in paperback. It's very heavy. And if you have trouble sleeping, it's excellent. But it's got some real golden nuggets in there around flow and um, related to this around prioritization. Um, so there's one technique that we used with these guys in Cardiff called weighted shortest job first. The aim being, get all these guys to agree on the criteria for making prioritization decisions. Yeah, so it might be related to some measure of, of business user value, um, maybe related to risk enabling opportunities. Um, and in this UK government department's context, they also were concerned about um, how 
the general public in the UK perceived them. So some reputational uh, aspect to um, prioritization criteria. You weight the appropriate criteria appropriately, and they all agreed. Yes, this seems to be the sensible way for us as an organization to be prioritization, prioritizing our big ticket initiatives. Um, you know, this seems pretty good. Great. Let's apply this to your current in flight set of projects. They did this and they freaked out because it was not at all what they expected. Um, as a result of this, and using other data points, so not just um, weighted shortest job first or whiz drift for short. They cancelled a bunch of projects, they reprioritized a bunch of projects, and they had a different focus going forward, less shouty shouty, because they'd already agreed to what was important, and more a focus on supporting from a, a lean agile mindset that organization. As we often see where We've introduced agility through agile teams. We've got little bubbles of agile floating in this organization. And they hit almost the glass ceiling of traditional organizational design. And above that, we've got traditional program project management, leadership expecting their status report every Friday, funding a whole year's work in advance instead of looking at funding potentially value streams. And we need to propagate, we need to break this ceiling to enable true business agility, agility to permeate the whole organization. So this takes us on to estimation. We figured out what we're gonna do. We figured out the order in which we're gonna do it. How do we know how to estimate how long it's gonna take? Um, I like this quote from John Maynard Keynes, better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. Some of you guys may have seen that one before. Um, and, you know, this kind of topic of precision is interesting from the perspective of if you have your, your 6,000 line Microsoft project plan, right, that you've lovingly created. It's in pristine condition. Delivery hasn't started yet. And it shows that in three years time, you will deliver on May the 24th at 3 p.m. Very precise forecast that you've got there. Not very accurate, but very precise. A lot of uh, estimation um, techniques used with agility. Um, the common one that we see around relative estimation using story points. Um, we see ideal days. Yeah, who has had an ideal day? I have never had. Um, an ideal day. You even see, um, if you've read Mike Cohn's book around agile estimation, um, and, and estimating and planning, dog points. Yeah, so we've got a story here, this is more of a chihuahua, and over here we've got a great day and maybe a golden retriever in the middle. It doesn't really matter which way you do it, as long as it's sensible, and as long as it's accurate, because most estimates um, that people make in terms of time value, hours, days, weeks, are going to be wrong. Um, so much so that I've kind of stopped using the word estimate and I'm using the word guess instead, which annoys people, but it's true. These are guesses, especially when you're um, estimating further out uh, in time. So relative estimation, whichever technique you use, is great. However, there are pitfalls with this as well if people don't use these techniques effectively. Story points, uh, measuring velocity. Um, leaders love to compare uh, velocity between multiple teams in a delivery organization. This is a big no-no because each team is doing their estimation within their own team's environment and context. So a three-point story in one team might be completely different to a three-point story in another. There are ways of aligning this, and there are pros and cons of, of doing that. But typically, we want to make sure that trust is embedded in teams. 
and if the leaders are constantly saying, you're not doing enough story points, that will have an impact on their behavior. Yeah? Any way of measuring what a team is doing, what a person is doing, um, you get the what's called the Hawthorne effect that will kick in, and they will change their behavior in ways that you may not expect. So be very careful with that. So from a trust perspective and a leadership perspective, we also need to look at the structure of our organizations. Um, I was talking to uh, Jeff McKenna a few years ago. Um, we were outside um, next to the canal in Amsterdam. We'd just uh, been in a session in a, a conference, a large scale scrum conference. And he said, forget scrum, forget Kanban, forget safe, less, nexus, all these frameworks. Just get a very large hammer and smash as many silos as you can, because that's what's killing you is from the perspective of an organizational design, different functional silos in an organization, um, inhibiting communication and collaboration, even within teams, even with our, within our agile teams, we see skill silos. I'm a Java developer, that's all I do. Uh, I don't care what the rest of my team are doing, I'm gonna do my thing. Um, and you know, this is kind of detrimental to the team as a whole because the unit of a delivery within a team is not a person, it is the whole team. And we need to encourage this focus on cross-functionality, on pairing, on understanding other people's work so that we can help out, right? Uh, those of you familiar with the Kanban method, um, recommend reading the Kanban Bible here by David Anderson, uh, may have been exposed to the concept of WIP or work in progress minutes. These kind of force collaboration, yeah? they force skill sets in silos to work with each other um, for the good of the team, get the whole team over the line. And these structures of teams are interesting as well. We've come across um, you know, component teams and feature teams, right? You guys are probably familiar with a you know, component team being maybe an API team or a front-end team, database team, and feature teams having this kind of ability to suit to not deliver um, value within the team. And those are the kind of structures we like. Uh, Matt Skelton and this book here, Team Topologies, um, has uh, kind of expanded this a little to four different um, team structures that can support uh, agility from a DevOps perspective, from a platform development perspective, um, but also mainly from uh, one of these uh, structures is called a stream aligned team to really focus on getting teams to deliver value at the end of a sprint, or if you're using Kanban method, whichever way you're working, we want to minimize the amount of dependencies we have with other teams. So have a little look at that book. Um, if you don't get it right, this kind of effect called cognitive load happens. This is when your working memory has too many things to think about at the same time. And how that applies to Agile teams is, right, well, I'm a Java developer and, and you're doing some testing there and you're working with Jira and we've got some analysis going on, but we're being interrupted constantly because we have all this administrative stuff to do. Um, I have to prepare all of this release management, release notes, get all this stuff put into different environments. Separate that out and look at the different supporting enabling team functions that can take that overhead, um, that interruption from your primary skill, your purpose in life within that team, take that, that kind of um, overload on your, uh, on your working memory, take it away and let teams be productive. So take a little look at uh, team topologies. Um, on the subject of Kanban, um, I like this little image here, cool guy, um, probably in Cambridge. Stop starting, start finishing. You guys have heard this mantra before, I am sure. Um, however, it's really important. 
Kanban method, um, when I train teams, we're looking at the key things. We talked about small batch sizes. Um, we need to enable consistent flow, consistent predictability, which is what leaders want, right? We want predictability in our delivery of value. Um, and Kanban, Scrum, they are not mutually exclusive. We often put a, a layer, a wrapper of Kanban method around Scrum teams to get the kind of best of both there, to understand where our bottlenecks are in our system, have a systems thinking perspective to see the whole and not locally optimize in one part um, of the system. And when we're going and we're delivering and we're developing, what do we measure? We talked about story points already, right? Um, and story points are inherently dangerous as a productivity measure for a team. They're very useful for product owners to see best worst case trends um, for medium term planning to understand if they're going to meet um, a milestone or not. Very useful. Not so useful um, for your sprint to sprint planning. I have seen teams use the yesterday's weather technique. We did 50 story points last sprint, we'll do 50 this sprint. And if you're a very mature team, you have good stability in your historical velocity, maybe that works for you. Teams that are pretty new to Agile and are all over the place and maybe are not even 100% allocated as far as capacity goes to a team will find this very tricky. So as far as what you do measure, Take a balanced scorecard approach. Look at lead time. Lead time is absolutely critical. The time that you commit to starting something until it's in the hands of customers delivering value. Yeah, so mapping that out, having a Kanban board that shows you all the value adding steps, all the delays between steps, understanding where your bottlenecks are, having constant improvement items to really focus on addressing and the bottleneck addressing the constraint at the point which it actually is and not before or after is critical. Looking at quality, so defects that have escaped into production, for example. Looking at outcomes, we talked about impact mapping and how to see if we're going in the right direction. And one that a lot of teams forget, looking at the health of our team. Um, there's a lot of good uh, free tools that Spotify used um, along different categories. Uh, for example, uh, are we releasing often into production? How do we feel about that as a team? Um, what's our kind of uh, level of uh, collaboration within the team? Lots of different factors. We can rate them green or red. Um, and we can do this often, maybe every couple of months, see the trends on some of these measures. Point values of measures, less useful trends really useful. All this comes down to having a good, stable support from senior leadership. Yeah, you can do Agile in a bubble, but senior leadership support is a crucial foundational aspect of uh, business agility functioning um, to the best it can be. So that's where we start. When we coach organizations, we start with the C-suite. We focus on leadership first, we educate the rest of the organization, and we bring the two together. Um, absolutely key, John Terry, um, who was uh, COO of, at least when I knew him, of uh, LeanKit, um, I had this quote from him on Twitter that the key to agile leadership Maybe learning to operate gracefully in an environment of frequent unpleasant surprises. You have seen this. Yeah. So how you respond to change um, as a leader is, is critical. Um, I found something that I hadn't seen just a couple of weeks ago um, on a topic that I thought, oh, this sounds really useful, and I'll bring this into this event, which was soul based leadership. What the hell is that, I thought. Um, so Dr. Karen sobel Lejeski um, has written a book about this, and this is focused on the aliveness of people in teams, um, especially working virtually, 
Um, a lot of team members that I coach uh, one-to-one almost feel like they're invisible when they're on calls with their teams, that people don't understand um, what they're going through, um, the challenges they have with their work. And we want to bring out that aliveness, that humanness again in our teams. Uh, this happens in physical environments as well, but it's much more prevalent, much more likely to happen um, in virtual environments when we're constantly on, on webcams, um, one meeting straight into the next, straight into the next. So having this focus on soul-based leadership, um, I thought was really interesting. It, it kind of answers the question of, are we really here? Are we really present um, and respected within our teams? Uh, and this thing popped up on, on Facebook the other day that um, I thought was quite good and, and quite profound, really, because at the end of the day, if we're appreciated, then we're going to go um, the extra mile, right? We're going to go the extra mile, and that will contribute to um, the development of what is this culture of an organization, right? Um, John Cotter, the kind of father of, of change management, and his books Leading Change, Accelerate, is focusing on you know, how do we enable, um, especially a culture for agility in an organization. Some leaders will say, we're doing this agile transformation thing, doing that now, so I need you to have an agile mindset and culture. I read that somewhere, off you go. Can't do that. Leaders have to go first, uh, as Simon Sinek says. Um, you have to exhibit the behaviors um, of authentic leadership um, that eventually will embed, as Cotter's last of his eight change management steps, embed that culture um, into an organization. Systems thinking, again, looking at the whole system of work, only leaders can change that system. So leaders need to do it. Thank you guys very much. Over to you, Martin. Excellent. Thank you, Bob, for sharing. Uh, this is Rob. Um, we've had some great comments coming through from people and, and a lot of good questions as well. So um, firstly, thanks for giving up your time uh, and sharing some knowledge. And I'll dive right into the questions. Um, mm. Ashok has said um, he started off on a, a light note. Uh, do you think there are any sock collectors in the washing machines as well? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then has followed it up with a question. Uh, when you are comparing traditional and agile, are you comparing like for like for success? Waterfall needs to be deliver the business case and should be agile, not a half to partial delivery as success. Mm, interesting. I think I think I know where it's going with that. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, um, Agile delivery should be appropriate to be used everywhere. Um, if you look at uh, the work of Ralph Stacy, there's a, if you Google Stacy matrix, um, you can see that dependent on the level of um, complexity of the technology you're using and the level of agreement of uh, requirements that you happen to manage. If you've got close agreement on requirements and you're using technology that's been around for years and you've got the skills, to be able to do it then you're kind of in this simple area of delivery and perhaps waterfall is appropriate um, in those cases um, i was was coaching at uh, a naval base in the uk so submarine refit base um, very rigid processes nuclear base um, nuclear approvals phase gates all that stuff but they still were able to infuse agility within that process. So it's just a question of um, how far can you go within your own environment? The key thing is, I mean, yeah, are you measuring similar things? As far as goals go, we want to be able to achieve the right strategic goals for an organization at any one time. Waterfall projects, they can be several years in duration. Um, requirements that were gathered at the beginning, um, 
usually we're under the 65 percent figure are not as valuable over time they'll degrade over time there's this requirements decay behavior that happens um, so that's why we're trying to focus constantly on what's important for our organization now how do we map we're looking at the impact mapping stuff how do we know the people who are using our software are actually exhibiting the right behaviors are getting what they need and often customers you know we have this focus on user and customer needs they often don't know what they want so we have to have these rapid feedback cycles to to show something so that they can see ah oh, yes that's what i was thinking of um and measure the appropriate things i'm not sure if i answered that question but hey <laughs> No, th thank you, Bob. Uh, and, and please let us know if um, you need Bob to expand on any of the answers, but uh, typically they come back with a, a great thanks very much. Um, when you mentioned 65%, does that mean the business case was also changed? Was the budgets modified with the time schedule? Uh, I, I would have to look at the uh, actual Standish Group Chaos Report to see uh, what they based their data on. But I think um if we look at it just from the data that i do have if you have a requirements document the contents of that um, the change and flux in that over that period of time on average because this was many hundreds of projects that they looked at um it's that flux in change of requirements that if we were uh, as a supplier working with a, a client um in a fixed everything kind of contractual arrangement um that's when the change request rears its ugly head. And that's not a, a great way of having a collaborative relationship um, with a client. So um, we're much more focused on what is right for client collaboration in order to get them what they need all the way through delivery and not just at the end of it. Excellent, um, excellent. excellent. thank you, Bob. And uh, Ashok's already come back about your answer to your first question that's a, and said uh, that's a great response to my first question so thank you. Um, okay. John, John's just made a remark um, I think a guess and an estimate are quite different I appreciate estimates are likely to be wrong but can generally be based on some understanding um, of the problem a guess is just a guess. Um, and it's funny I was running a, a scrum class today uh, first of two day um a registered scrum class um and day one end of day one i'm always touching on estimation and it always upsets people <laughs> um but it, it, it's it's a really uncomfortable subject for some um in that they I, i've seen people almost attaching their identity to estimating in the longer term it's also very tricky. Um, I work with the IBM Solutioning Center in Dublin that look at very large projects, and they they have to have some idea of the size of the thing before they can go through the whole contractual process. Um, there's a whole bunch of techniques and tools um, out there that that they use for this, and you can get a general idea from um, that large project perspective from you know, maybe comparing a similar project, similar technology, similar amount of teams involved. Um, but when you get down to the nitty gritty of delivery, that is when we want to really be focused on which direction are we going in and what are the, the ranges of estimates that um, we can use to inform us as to what's gonna happen in the future. I think there's uh, Neil Bohr, the physicist who said, um, that uh, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Excellent. Thank you, Bob. Um, and I've got a, a load of uh, nice comments saying thank you again. Um, I'll end on one additional, well, it's a remark that then goes into a question. Um, and then I'll also welcome Martin back in a couple of moments to, to say thanks and, and close us out. But the remark is you cannot delete every deliverable in the business case that is six months old in a waterfall project. Are we all playing to the same rules in agile and waterfall? Well, and I, I think that's the question, isn't it? And, and no, we're not. 
Um, but should we be? Um, you know, waterfall is one method of delivery that might be appropriate in, in certain circumstances. If you're building a house, for example, as far as software goes, software is in the realm of um, what we would call a complex adaptive system where um, a small change in one area can have a massive impact um, in another area. So we've really got to understand that these requirements or these user stories in a backlog, we shouldn't be aiming to deliver all of it. We should be focusing kind of Pareto principle where you know, 80% of the value is coming from 20% of those user needs or, or, or requirements. So it's not a competition between one or the other um, about waterfall and agile. Why are you using waterfall, I guess is the question. With software delivery, some mechanisms for um, agility, you know, we would encourage those ways of working. If it's contractual, then that's another question. Um, I've written several uh, points of view with the, the solutioning guys at IBM over different contracting models, which is a whole other topic, um, whole fixed everything versus capacity based um, time and materials, etc. And they all, like everything else, have an impact on the behavior of teams and organizations. So it, it's a very tricky, wide ranging subject, I would say. Excellent. Thank you. Um, again, uh, we've had a response saying, great response again to my remark. Uh, love it with a thumbs up. Uh, Sharon, and I'll end on this one. I can see Martin's back with us, but uh, Sharon has said, really interesting session. Um, thank you, Bob, for sharing your insights. Definitely food for thought. Um, and I've got a whole host of comments like that, Bob. So uh, from my perspective in the APM, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll pass over to Martin to, to close us out. Yes, thank you very much, Bob. A really, really intelligent and very measured look at Agile and what Agile is. Uh, I, I've attended sort of a number of these things over the years, and it's always intriguing. I think your approach is about the Agile. As you didn't mention mindset. That's really what you're talking about. is an Agile mindset. And so certainly when you're looking at the leadership aspects of that, it has to come from the top because it's about culture, about the whole approach to it. Uh, but you've just been discussing uh, sort of contracting for Agile. And I know the uh, contracts and procurement to SIG have been looking at that. Uh, there are ways you can contract for Agile, but again, you have to have a, the Agile mindset in your customer because they have to make sure that the, the contract they're giving and you agree with them allows you to have that Agile mindset and you're not going to be sort of held feet to the fire if things don't go quite according to plan because because that's life. And if and I think it depends uh, it depends entirely on the circumstances. If you have a project which is really uncertain, you really don't know how you're going to deliver it, you're not sure what, what, what the outcomes are going to be in the end, Agile is wholly and absolutely appropriate for it because you need to break it up into bite-sized chunks to see where you're going. I think your idea of the uh, goal actor impact and then the deliverable is a really good one because if you know what the impact you want, you can play with the deliverables and, and try them out. Fantastic approach. I think it's a really, really sensible approach for that. To go for that's something we can you can build into it into waterfall if you want to my background is defense and so i fully understand where you're coming from with your customer down at devonport <laughs> uh, with that uh, uh, but i've realized i've been doing agile for years because you break the way that mod goes about buying equipment is it doesn't understand the requirement is it spends the first part of the procurement cycle trying to define what the requirement actually is by giving prototypes and things to the user to play around with give us feedback and define and refine the requirements it goes forward. So I think it's, it's, uh, it has echoes all the way along, along that as well. But all under all under waterfall, not called agile at all. But uh, you can think back and reflect, think, okay, I've been doing that for for ages, but not with quite the discipline. I wouldn't claim to have done Scrum masters and all that sort of stuff, or use Kanban boards. But uh, I think there's some really good techniques out there. And you say you take an agnostic approach to this because it's courses of courses depends on the context in which you're operating in what works well for you, your organization, your customer, your supply chain, and everything else. So I think it's been a really fascinating uh, sort of evening. And thank you very, very much indeed for a fantastic insight into uh, uh, Agile in, in the very roundest possible sense. It's very much appreciated. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Mark.